we'll start uh, part one and then um, we'll set the stage for what, uh, when we say the word Christian or words, Christian nationalism, what that is. I, if you If you look it up, there's all sorts of crazy things that come up. And uh, some things are good and some things are bad and some things are uh, reactionary to a bunch of things. Um, and everything seems to be, at least now, uh, political. And so we'll talk about, is everything actually political? Um, and, uh, and we'll kind of set the stage today. We'll define a couple terms, but we'll work through those definitions because we'll, we'll do two more. Uh, of these, um, and that way we can we can uh, sort of dissect what it what when people talk about it, what do they mean? Because there's also there's a very negative um, way of looking at Christian nationalism in terms of uh, if you're looking at it on a political spectrum, uh, left or right, there are very negative connotations for both, and uh, and some that we would not, in terms of scripture, agree with. Uh, for sure. So uh, we'll work through those things and um, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Just a reminder, next Thursday we won't meet because I won't be here. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to come here at 11 o'clock on Thursday. But I, I won't be here. I'll be in uh, Florida. So. Uh, right. Yeah. All right. On a whirlwind tour. You'll be sweating. You will be sweating. Yeah. Um, it's a good, it's a good kind of heat, yeah. right? Sweat all the time. Uh, good sleeping weather. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. yeah. All right. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer. Blessed Lord, we give you thanks that you have given to us your holy word. Help us always that we put ourselves under it, that what you have said and who you are, and what you have revealed to us in our Lord Jesus Christ that he truly is our Lord, Lord over this world, over this government that we live in, and this church most especially, but all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Lord, help us to remain under that authority and in his grace, by his holy word, always. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... Uh, you know, you you set the stage for something, um, and even something that can be controversial, perhaps. But uh, you think about Isaiah chapter sixty. The latter part of Isaiah is is, um, is always the most uh, intense. It seems like of Isaiah for sure. Uh, but Isaiah says, "For the nation and kingdom that does not serve you, I mean, the Lord God shall perish." And those nations shall be utterly laid to waste. And, and that is the reality. There's the nation of God. The kingdom of God is the thing that endures forever because it is in the word, because the word endures forever. Um, and there is a reality when you talk about living this life. We, we've talked about this in a bunch of different Bible studies in terms of um, all things that are good and just and holy uh, are from the Lord God. And so nothing exists outside of him, including life and salvation, most especially. So all of these things derive from that. And he has created this world in an order. And in that order, there is a, a natural understanding of how certain things should be that causes us to act in a certain way. But you can see how people are created in his image and that it is his creation and the law is written into that, the natural law, uh, moral law. And so um, those things drive how nations exist, how people act, not even just Christian people, but even pagan people. And so uh, I think we can we can kind of set the stage for that. But Isaiah does for sure. Those who go against that, for one, it's foolish. It's stupid uh, because it goes against the natural order by which God has created all things. And two, um, there are repercussions for it. Uh, most especially, there are spiritual repercussions in a condemnation, a damnation of God, 
that he comes and, and cuts them off. He crushes those who are idolaters and wicked. Um, but also there's a, a temporal sort of uh, in this time now repercussion of that stuff. He makes laws and then we sin. We have to deal with the ramifications of that sin now. And we we sometimes we give the example of, you know, God made gravity. If I violate that, then I have to deal with the repercussions of that, you know, hurting myself if I fall from a large distance, even if I say, well, I don't believe in that. Um, and that's silly, but it, but it kind of speaks to the truth of if I uh, go against what the will of God is in life, then I will have to deal with a negative uh, uh, reaction to that. Most notably from God himself, who, who punishes the wicked um, and uh, punishes them so that they can bring, he can bring them about to repentance, to know that he is the true God. So if we're going to define some terms, probably the best way to do that is just to walk through these. And we'll walk through these terms as we continue in the study. If you say Christian, who's a Christian? And in this context, we would say those who confess the Apostles' Creed. That's the most basic uh, scriptural uh, and historic understanding of Christianity. Um, those who do not confess the truths that are found in the Apostles' Creed would we would consider themselves heretics outside of the Christian church. So that would be uh, those who are like Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not confess the Trinity as revealed in Scripture. They don't, uh, uh, they don't confess that Jesus Christ is God and man. Um, and so they, uh, they are not Christian in that sense, even if they appear to, to uh, put themselves across as that. Um, we talk about a nation. What's a nation? You know, a nation could, could, can be defined as a group with a shared name, shared language, shared sense of place or history, a sense of belonging or kinship, um, shared cultural conventions and customs, and widely shared set of beliefs and values. And I don't know any other way that you could set it apart from defining what a nation is. A nation has a culture. Do, does our nation have a culture? It does, absolutely. Um, and uh, you even see that in Scripture. I mean, we could go to the Tower of Babel and talk about these things, how God separates the people. He makes them into different people groups, and they go to make different nations as well. You see that on uh, the redemption of, of uh, what happened in the Tower of Babel on the day of Pentecost, when in the church, they're all speaking the same language, which, which is the proclamation of the gospel. But still, there are different groups um, that, uh, that exist there. Paul talks about this when he preaches in the Areopagus in Athens, when he talks about the unknown God that they worship there and the idol that they have. He says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He's talking about Adam, right? and has determined their appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. God makes nations, and they have boundaries, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have uh, our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also uh, his offspring. So again, you think about God creates man, and he orders the world together, um, and we can apply that to, to government as well, and we'll talk about that. Nationalism, right? Um, what is nationalism? It's not fascism, and if you, if you know what fascism is, it is a form of government that has a strict authoritarian rule over it. Uh, fascism is like a modern world word for an absolute monarchy in a sense, but without an idea of passing on that kingship or queenship or that royalness onto the the uh, the next uh, the offspring of that monarch. Um, business and government are the same thing. They they can be they can be. Uh, 
I mean, I think that that kind of morphs into an understanding of socialism as well. But I, I, I don't know if I would agree with the term fascism and socialism are the same. I don't think they are. They can be. And I would say, you know, uh, like Stalin, uh, Stalinist, communist Soviet Union is fascist in the sense that the people are ruled by an authority one set authority or even a group a ruling soviet or or when you think about stalin too um but nationalism is not militaristic either um i i, I think uh when you when you look at the way it's portrayed now uh most of the time when people say nationalism they think fascist or nazi or some kind of military expansion or something like that and I, i've got news for you i mean nationalism is, is an is a social uh philosophy that's developed later um in the uh 18th 19th and 20th century but it's i mean when you talk about military expansionism and uh nations doing things i mean that's existed throughout all time so um a good definition would be it, it refers to the nation acting as a people for their national good that would be the most basic definition of what nationalism is. In fact, when you look it up, the, the, the accepted definition is the idea that a nation should be congruent, working together with a state in relationship between people and government. That's actually, I mean, there you go. There's a citing from, from 1983 um, from, from Gellner. Um, essentially, the government promotes the interests of the people in that nation. And the people would want that. That's nationalism. Now, can it be bad and naughty? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for sure. There, there's a contrasting view, and that would be something called globalism. And that's this process of interaction or integration among people and companies and governments worldwide. And that's a focus on many countries, not solely on, on a single nation. Um, and the the international monetary fund has a definition for it which i mean again that would be a, a globalism or a globalist understanding they, they would be at the heart of that and they, they'd say there's four basic aspects of it in terms of globalization which is trade and transaction capital and investment movements money um immigration uh, migration and movement of people and the dissemination of knowledge essentially the dissemination of knowledge is in there with the uh the IMF. And all four uh, of those things, of the knowledge they want you to have. All four of those things are focused on the increase of globalism. Right. It's focused on a global understanding, um, not so much of, of an individual nation state understanding. Which is amazingly similar to fascism. Um, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think I, you have to, I guess if you want to define what fascism, we could talk a little bit about that um, and uh, go into more detail about it, but you know, there's a big difference between uh, Franco Spanish fascism and uh, Nazism fascism and even Italian fascism. Like they're they're different. Um, and uh, and again, that's actually not where we're at. Yeah. We're not in a fascist country. And I don't know why anyone would want that. You know, people want strong leadership in something. And they they want uh, everyone to be united in it when it's behind the idea that they want. So like, uh, I, you know, you really want a king. Sounds like the Old Testament. You really want a king. And so then what does the Lord God say? I'll give you one. And he's going to be like the rest of the kings that are around and you're going to regret it. Okay. And they did. And they got Saul. So um and even in subsequent kings after that, even with aspects of David and certainly with Solomon and the, the latter kings that come from that, I mean, they got what they wanted. And so you want a king when the king is is uh, doing the things you want him to do. Um, but uh, but again, you know, when you talk about America and where God has placed us here in the United States, you know, to say that it's the best is not to say that it's the best in its actions or even what it represents to, but it's the best because the Lord has given it to us. Like it's ours. We're here. Just like your family is the best because you would consider so because you've been placed in that family. Right. And so it, it you should be concerned about the interests of it and you should be, uh, 
an advocate for it because it is you. And uh, and so those things are connected in there as well. It would be better to say it is the best for me. Because saying it is the best would, would infer that the Cullen family is not the best. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could do that. You could do that. But, uh, you know, I think sometimes I feel like the rub is, you know, and again, we'll talk about this. Everyone is political. And I would say that's garbage. Not everything is not political, by the way. Uh, but we'll talk about that and where that comes from. But this idea that, you know, if I say America's great and that means, you know, France is not good. I France is not good. It's not the same as us. You wouldn't want to live there. I'll be honest with you. Absolutely. It might be nice to visit, right? But if you were living there, you would say, yikes. The same thing with other countries. I mean, I'm sure we can have some idealistic view of what another country would look like and some perfect culture. But, you know, having lived in another country myself, you you what either will happen is you either assimilate to that culture and you become part of it and accept that as your own or if you don't do that, you will despise it. You will have some kind of animosity towards it. Um, England. Right. I mean, that's what they, that's, right. they're well, suffering through right now in England and Germany. And yeah. And, and, and nationalism, I mean, there's a lot of different forms of that. Something, I mean, Scottish nationalism would be the, the desire for Scotland to be its own nation, right? Which I would argue is going to end poorly for them if they, that, that's the way it goes. But, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's it's, you know, your shared group, you're here, you're this is your country and you want what's best for it. Um, and you want that what's best for it. Not so much what's best for the entire globe, because we are, in fact, different and we have different views and we have different shared commonality and history, um, even a different language and things like that. We have a different culture. So. Um, you know, I think nationalism doesn't speak against people make this idea about the melting pot that is our country. Right. And and it's true. Right. All these different folks have come here. They melt into it. But the point of the melting pot is they melt in and assimilate to who we are as a culture. We've developed that. It's not like America is 10 years old and we don't have any cultural at all. I mean, we have a culture. We have a shared language. We have a food. You know what I mean? Even though sometimes it might be amalgamations of foods from other countries, but they're very much Americanized, right? So if you go to a Chinese restaurant here in Sullivan, it's very different than eating Chinese food in Beijing, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. No dog, less cat here. No dog, less cat. <laughs> right? Well, I'm not saying that, but <laughs> yeah. We don't know. In fact, in fact, here in Sullivan, what I experience at the Chinese restaurant is they will give you a bag of. A flaming hot Cheetos to go with your uh, Chinese food. Okay. And yeah. says China is better than flaming hot Cheetos. So, um, actually, that's a uh, that's a cuisine. They're, they they take those flaming hot Cheetos and mix those with other things, and it's like a snack that the Chinese. I, I saw it on a TV it's not show. Oh. Though. It's well, not though. It's something uh, It's takis. Oh, okay, yeah, takis and stuff. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I I think you know the melting pot is the idea that people are coming into our culture and they're they're assimilating and sometimes we do a good job and sometimes we don't. And sometimes in that assimilation, they bring part of that culture in there, but it still becomes an American culture. So, I mean, I, I would say when somebody says you don't have a culture and I hear this, Americans don't have a culture, you don't have anything like that. That's not true. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't think nationalism discredits the idea of uh, immigration people from other countries. Um, I think, though, in terms of mass immigration that's unchecked, there can be a problem because it doesn't give time for a nation to assimilate the people that are coming in. And so you you want people to assimilate because if they don't, then they develop an animosity towards the culture that you're living in because it's sometimes very different. Another ism, a tribalism. Right. So, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. When you're 19 years old and you go to live in Korea, right? And once the newness of being there wears off, you you uh, desire to be in a place where you feel like you're connected with everyone else and that you're actually a part of the culture because you have this, you know, uh, interconnective relationship that's built into you. 
And uh, when something is so different, which Korean culture is, I'm not saying it's bad. There's actually some wonder wonderful aspects of it, but it's different. It causes you to go through a phase of not liking being there, right? So, um, so then you think about what is Christian nationalism? If you if you want to kind of and we'll work through this because there's a bunch of definitions of that just a, a, a base working definition would be a belief that human society requires something to anchor it, transition uh, a, a a transcendent, a godly anchor to hold everything together, and that transcendent anchor would be in the true and living God, not in false idols. In other words, I mean, your your country, America, is Christian by all intensive purposes, at least in a confession, and by how our sort of laws are orchestrated around this understanding of uh, the true and living God who has created all things, then you kind of want it to be anchored in that, because if it doesn't, it'll be anchored in something else, and and that would be... Uh, against the will of God, um, and there comes a problem. I mean, you have to deal with that, and it, it's a society that's, for one, very different from what you grew up in, and two, it's um, uh, it will reap the repercussions of what it's doing. And then this is an understanding, too, that civil law, and again, I don't think, at least in the definition of all of these different resources that I've been through, Christian nationalism wouldn't say civil law is there to compel belief in the gospel. So no one's talking about going out and forcing people to believe uh, by a sword, right? I think there's another religion that's very good at that, which would be Islam. And um, nor is it forcing people to worship uh, God or to uh, orchestrate faith in that way. But what we should want is that our uh, our government is conducive um, to the focus of that worship so that it promotes that um, and not is diametrically opposed to it. And we'll talk about separation of church and state um, and where that term even comes from. And I mean, is that even a scriptural thing? Um, but you know, I, I don't, I have a hard time understanding people who don't want to be in a country that at least promotes the same morality that you have as a Christian, you should want that. And we'll talk about even the Lutheran confessions frame government in that way. Government is for, uh, the peace and quiet of God's people. God ordains it so that you can live in a, in a, uh, in a nation or a society that's going to punish the wicked and that's going to promote the peace. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would, okay, I want that. And I want that of my own nation, right? If I want the best uh, of my own nation, I would want them to be explicitly Christian. Um, and we can walk down the, the road of talking about, well, what about we have a lot of people who are not Christian in our nation and we can talk about that. I'm sure it's going to come up, but we'll definitely talk about it in part two and three. So setting the stage here, right? We want to think about what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And you say, well, what is the will of God, right? Because you're supposed to test all these things as a Christian to that. What's the will of God? Well, the only way you can find that will is in his holy word, right? It's not going to be beamed into your brain. And so God's will is that uh, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, right? God's will is that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will ri raise him up on the last day. Uh, we can know God's will from what he wants and how he wants us to live, uh, as we listen to our Lord Jesus and uh, the apostles explain in the Ten Commandments. So again, we have a moral framework of how God, what, what God wants from us. Um, and then uh, we can know his will and how he gives us his means of grace and how he wants that to be administered among us. Um, he wants us to receive the forgiveness of sins. 
And so even the third petition of the Lord's Prayer in the small catechism deals with this, right? We pray, thy will be done as in uh, uh, on earth as in heaven. Uh, what does it mean? The good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer, uh, but we pray in this petition that it may be done also among us. And then you say, well, what's the will of, uh, what's God's will done? How is it done? Well, God's will is done when it breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world and our sinful nature, uh, which do not want us to hallow God's name and let his kingdom come. Uh, and when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. So if I'm discerning everything on the will of God, right? This is his good and gracious will. If I'm discerning everything that is the will of God, uh, what's that will? It's breaking and hindering every evil plan and purpose of the devil and the world and myself. Um, so... When we go through this, you want to think about your Christian faith is not as something that's compartmentalized. And this is what people like to do all the time. So I, I, I uh, there's a false belief that Christians live functionally compartmentalized lives. Two false worlds, right? Uh, a real life and my spiritual life, right? My, my real life is probably the one I'm most comfortable with. Maybe <laughs> things are going well, I guess. And that's the stuff I do every day right? My job, physical health, friends, family, leisure, money, possessions, voting, citizenship, daily routine, kind of all those things that I just sort of do throughout my day. That's my real life. And then I also have this other subsection under that called my spiritual life. And that's all the stuff of God that goes there. Worship, Bible study, piety, devotion, offerings, uh, even in evangelistic conversations, all that stuff happens in a spiritual world. And the problem is faith becomes just an aspect of your life and not something that shapes life or is life. Um, and a better way to frame it is, a better way to frame it is to say you cannot do that. I mean, I, I would argue people, you cannot have a compartmentalized faith. It does not exist. So you're going to do things in this life, even in our uh, our government and how we conduct ourselves as citizens, based upon what you believe. And you either believe in the word of God or you do not. And so, um, or perhaps you're ignorant to it. I mean, that could be another category <laughs> to it as well. So scripture kind of reveals your Christian life not as one that's in compartments, but one that you are an ambassador, uh, right? And Paul writes, now then we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, uh, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? Meaning, the only thing an ambassador does is represent the ruler who sent them every day, all the time, and everything they do. So everything you do um, is a matter of faith. Every single thing. And, and there is no separation of that. We Sometimes we talk about secular and sacred things. I, I There's no such thing. Everything has a theological implication in what you do because you do things based on what you believe or you believe things based on what you do. Would it be safe to say the sacred things amplify the secular things? Yeah, I mean, they should. They should, because, again, in the sacred things, you would think um, those are matters of faith in which God is, if you want to put it, in, I guess, in the best term, that God is speaking to you in his holy word and sacraments and the word preached. And so God is informing how you should do those other things as well um, and how you live your life as a Christian. I mean, the point of this is to say everything isn't political. And, and if you think that your politics, and this might be spicy, but if you think that your political life or your politics are separate from, from what the word of God says and you call yourself a Christian, then you're going to have to look at what God's word actually says and you're going to have to put yourself under it. Now that can cause you to do a bunch of things. And um, 
And again, I'll be really clear. I'm not talking about things like Republican and Democrat. I don't I could care less about that. Those two things, because, again, I don't live my life as everything is a political theory. Right. Both can be bad. Both could do good things. Right. The whole point of it is I put myself under the word of God. I'm a new creation. I've been bought with the price. I'm not my own. And so the one who now owns me, who is Lord and master, who is Christ Jesus, he dictates everything for me. And that should drive you to, to do things in a certain way, want things in a certain way as well. So the, the world promotes something different. And I, I would say if you view everything in a political sense, which a lot of people do, especially now, it seems like every four years, things become more and more political. So if you view everything in a political sense, I, I would say that's Marxism, right? Because Marx would say, and here's a quote from Marx. It's always good to have Marx quotes, Karl Marx quotes in uh, Bible study. But he says human beings, he he writes, a, this is part of a, a bunch of uh, unfinished, The it's a series of seven things he's writing, Um but a human being is a is a at the most literal sense a political animal, not merely a a social a animal, a gregarious animal. So an animal which is can individuate itself only in the midst of society, uh, production by an isolated individual outside of society is as much as absurdity as the development of language without individuals living together and talking to each other. So, I mean, what he's saying is at your base everything is political. Uh, for Marx, everything is a class struggle. Class to class con uh, conflict is the foundation of viewing this world and life. Um, and everything has a, a means of being political. Um, and, and at the root of Marxism, and we've talked about this before, is this atheistic uh, philosophy that there's really no room left for God, that everything is by your own hand and by the hand of those in a collective. And so, I mean, Marx is, is, uh, is all about the, uh, the, the destruction of religion. Um, he thinks it would bring about the happiness of people. That worked really well in the Soviet Union. Mm. And Russians are known to be happy. Did you know that? That's not true. They're not known to be happy at all. So anyway, <laughs> maybe that's uh maybe that's um some of that is probably environmental in terms of like where they live Not at and climate. sunlight all the time yeah, yeah yeah but you know i mean yeah. um uh, in your bottom with cardboard's probably bad right right but the marxist model makes the state become the provider the sustainer the protector the lawgiver of every citizen in short the state is viewed as god right so you know marxist governments don't like the idea that there being any higher authority than themselves the the point would be when you talk about a nation and i would say any nation because all nations in scripture derive their authority from god who places them there even if they don't know it that's where it comes from <laughs> that he is the ultimate lawgiver in that sense, and they put themselves under that, and so they act in accord with how he's, uh, his will is, going back to that uh, Romans chapter 12 aspect. <laughs> so scripture warns, we talk about Christians and everything being political and you becoming some political animal, um, uh, that... Paul writes, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So when we talk about separation of church and state, is that a thing? I would say, depends on what you mean by that. But it's an abused political theory that the church and state can actually be separate. Maybe a better way to say is that they are distinct, and that's the Lutheran way, and we'll build that. But um, the church and state are both institutions, so it's impossible. It's possible to keep them separate without confusing a category of what they're in. I mean, you could put apples and oranges are both fruit, and you can put them uh, in separate bowls. However, it's impossible to separate moral considerations and the state. 
I may, that we may discern what the will of God is. So again, uh, I, uh, it's impossible to separate how you want yourself to be governed and how you act in government um, from who you are as a Christian. And when we use separation of church and state in a modern sense, it becomes an excuse to try to exclude any religion, but most especially Christianity, from any type of decision-making within the government. And that's actually how it gets developed. So if you think in the U.S. Constitution, right, the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Everyone's like, oh, perfect. For one, that means the federal government. I just want to point that out. It's not talking about the state. When these things are enacted, did state governments at the time have their own churches? And when they say religion, they're talking about denominations of Christianity. They're talking about denominations of Christianity, right? So I mean, they write the Constitution. They make they they we we have a nation that's founded in the and it presupposes when they do so that everyone is at least culturally Christian, that it is a Christian base for things. Uh, because this idea of, well, some people are not, I mean, again, we could talk about Thomas Jefferson, and he had some wackadoodle ideas about stuff, but he still considered himself, in the broadest sense, Christian, and in Christendom, right? Even though, you know, people like to argue that they were deists and stuff like that, and sure, I mean, you have Unitarians that come out of that and all this stuff like that. I got news for you. Unitarians back in the day considered themselves Christian. So, uh, in fact, if you're a Unitarian chaplain in the U.S. Army, you wear a cross. Um, My mother was Unitarian. Before. Right. They're, I mean, they still consider themselves Christian. Wrong, but still consider themselves Christian. And so it presupposes all that. And so you think, I mean, if our... If our country and nation is built upon the foundation of uh, the understanding that people are Christian, you know, I think some people don't like the don't like to say, well, America's not a Christian nation. But I mean, it's built upon that framework that this is what everyone has in mind. No one's talking about when they're writing the Constitution and they're, they're talking about the establishment of religion. They're not thinking about, well, Islam is coming in and we've got to make an accommodation for them. Or Hinduism. Or Hinduism. Yeah, or Buddhism. Now, with that being said, it doesn't mean, I'm, I mean, I think you would be silly to say, well, let's go out and uh, purge all of those people from our country if they're in, that, that are here, um, or that let's go out and forcibly convert them into Christianity. No, but our governmental structure is designed to promote the understanding that uh, Christianity is uh, our shared cultural, or at least in a cultural sense, and should promote the uh, 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 Christian morality and beliefs. Um, and so the phrase separation of church and state, right, is, is actually taken from a letter from Thomas Jefferson. He writes to the Danbury Baptists, which is which they're in Connecticut. And again, the Danbury Baptists were concerned about uh, denominational Christianity stuff that was going to be established, right? Because you think about who comes to this country at the very beginning, there are people, I mean, even the, the early beginnings of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, they come here because uh, they're dissenting with whatever political establishment for religion has been happening in Europe, and they come here for the free expression of that, all still Christian in that regards. And so Thomas Jefferson writes, he uses this term, um, that the government would stay out of church affairs. That the government would stay out of church affairs, there's not an understanding that the government would not put itself under the living God who is ruler of, of all things. Um, it's and, funny, I was reading Roger Williams, one of my descendants, but I was reading some of his manuscripts that he wrote, uh, and, and a lot of the things that you're talking about is part of the reason why he wanted freedom of religion that he was baptist but sure. the reasons why he wanted separation of church and state so the church was predominantly in charge of the religion at that point in time the mm -hmm. 1500s so it, it's it's interesting a lot of the things you're saying i i'm sure. calling was written down in his his laws i'll give them to you sometime yeah well i'm to see how he thinks yeah and you think i mean um 
you know, uh, the separation of church and state is, you know, th there's been an intermingling of those things that have happened throughout history, some good and some bad. Uh, but I, I, again, I don't know why you wouldn't want your government, the nation that you have, it's your nation to be Christian. Because if you think your what God has ordained is true, then then everyone would benefit from a world that is ordered in that way, um, unless they are uh, wicked and they want to promote wickedness. And that should be destroyed. But I mean, even in the small catechism, we talk about God's will is to crush and destroy, deter wicked plans, even within us, right? Um, and we don't often pray, pray that because uh, that might be too hard. So, all right. So the this wall of separation uh, metaphor didn't really enter into a discourse, a discussion in our country until the 1947 Supreme Court case of um, Everson versus the Board of Education. And, and if you don't know about that, uh, it comes about where 1941 in New Jersey, they enact a law that authorizes the payments by local school boards for the costs of transportation to and from school, including private schools. And so most of the private schools that were in New Jersey, if you've ever been in New Jersey, I have, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you ever been, I'm just joking. If you ever been in New Jersey, it's, you know, the majority of the private schools there were parochial Catholic schools. And so um, Everson, who's a taxpayer in New Jersey, uh, files a lawsuit on state constitutional grounds. And then the New Jersey Supreme, Supreme Court uh, held the provision, uh, said that the provision violated the state constitution, um, that the legislative power was authorizing spending money for private and parochial school. That 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 was later overturned by something called the New Jersey New Jersey Courts of Errors and Appeals, and then it went to the Supreme Court, which decided the case on a federal sense. And again, what the Supreme Court decides kind of carries weight throughout all the states, right? Because it's the Supreme Federal Court. And in a in a very tight decision, they uphold that the state law handed down right was was accurate that they uh, uh, the state. Uh, could not establish uh, a uh, a funds going to uh, church schools to transport kids back and forth, right? Um, so it, it's an it's an explanation of of how this establishment clause of religion gets to be used, um, and that uh, New Jersey law had had uh, uh, violated uh, the law when they did that, right? They had violated this establishment clause. So what happens and after that is, you know, what was originally intended in the Constitution to keep two governments separate, state and federal, distinct, consequently turned into an idea that we can banish all Christianity from the exercise of the government, uh, governmental actions, right? So you think the Constitution is designed to keep a very clear distinction between uh, what the federal government does and the state government does, I think that gets lost now anyway. But the establishment of religion clause is now used not to say that um, we want to keep that distinction distinction there, but in fact, we want to keep all religion, really Christianity, out of anything that the government does. So you can't use a Christian moral framework to decide laws or how things should go. And you can see you know, 1947, you can see how the ramifications of that have continued on in our own culture and in our own government, right? So uh, you think about they removed prayer from school. They removed things like the Ten Commandments. They removed things that were explicitly Christian that used to be done in school or by the government. And, you know, that continues to go on. I, I'm, I'm not saying whether all of that stuff is good or not. I mean, we can discuss those things on an individual level um, of each individual instance of what was removed from, from the government. But I will say, I mean, you can kind of see the result of those things where the government becomes explicitly uh, non-Christian and how it does things. And you get the kind of fruit of that that we're living in right now. So, um, 
it, you know, the excuse that you can't have Christian thought and morality, the foundation of all human dignity, I would argue, <laughs> influence uh, a government. That's what comes out of that. So the separation of church and state doesn't really exist. I mean, what you believe informs how you act and how you act informs what you believe. Um, what other laws? I mean, it says the excuse that you can't have Christian thought and morality to influence what government does, but so what other thoughts would they? Yeah, so then we, okay, so then we start to have the the removal of laws, both state and federally, that were we'll say are probably exclusively Christian in what they do. So blasphemy laws are, are go away. They used to be illegal to blaspheme the Lord God, right? In fact, in Europe, I mean, at, at one point it's, you know, punishable by death. Marbury versus Madison. That's where they legalize gay marriage. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, um, yeah. Um, so then you have, yeah, things like, uh, non-traditional marriage. Um, you have a different definition of what marriage is. Uh, you have, um, I'll give you a really good example uh, in the, I mean, this is the law that I know the best in, in the UCMJ, in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. At one point, I mean, while I was working cases, the law was sodomy is was illegal. You couldn't do. You couldn't have uh, have any uh, sodomy acts while you were in the military, and then those things um, uh, that that's gone now. The state laws used to do that too, right? You know, like down home. You know, like you down home, you couldn't go into the stores were closed on Sunday. Right. Uh, you couldn't buy alcohol. You know, before a certain time, and also like sodomy and things like that. And then also the marriage laws were different, right? Too. Yeah, and. Um, uh, I mean, I would also say things like um, when you talk about the laws around divorce change after 1947 uh, to include things like no fault divorces um, and um, uh, the death penalty is one that that our the Missouri Senate has actually held convention and discussed about that changes. Um, and again, it changes in the fact that people uh, uh, laws remove the death penalty from the a punishment, capital punishment uh, for certain crimes. And um, which again, there's a Christian framework for all those things as well. So, I mean, th those would be examples, I think that that would come up and it continues. I mean, I mean, you can see it kind of play out right now <laughs> all the time, but, um, but yeah, I, I think the problem is people would have the greatest rub about that. They would be very much upset about those things that I just said that it's bad that those are gone because they uh, either for one, they profess to be Christian and they are in fact ignorant of what the will of God is because they don't know his word. Or they are uh, openly promoting wickedness, which God has defined and they don't care what that says and they want to continue to promote it. And, and again, both of those are bad. Um, and uh, and I think that's why people get so upset about it. Uh, One leads to the other. I mean, you're talking about the the prayer and church leaving, and then it just seems like you yeah. know, or prayer and school. Sorry, yeah. not state church, but prayer and school is leaving. And, yeah. and as you see that go away, you see more nefarious, what biblically nefarious activities right. increasing. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the same thing. People are very upset now about uh, Louisiana. They have enacted a law that requires the Ten Commandments. And, you know, our our uh, uh, translation of the Ten Commandments, by the way, so with the Second Commandment is of not uh, misusing the name of the Lord your God. And in the, uh, so they enacted a law, well, that's in every classroom. And there are, and I've met Lutheran pastors who are upset about that as well. So I don't really see the problem with it. And I, and I don't know why, if you are a Christian and you profess these things, why, at the very least, why would you not want a proclamation of the law of God, which leads sinners to repent, right? Because they know that they've sinned. Why would you want that at least explicitly put out there? And, and I guess sometimes you could make the argument that you, you want to be careful not to create cultural Christianity, where people are culturally Christian, but they're not really Christian. I think that's a separate issue. 
I don't think that's one that you're like, I'm going to promote an idea of everyone's culturally Christian, but they're not really Christian because I'm discerning the things inside their heart, even though I can't actually see them. So, so I mean, um, and in fact, I mean, I'll say even in my own, you know, in my own seminary, some of that is, is thrown across as well. And, um, it's judging people in my opinion. Right. But you would think God ordains government for the benefit of his people and for the punishment of, of the wicked and that so that God's people can live peaceful lives. And those peaceful lives mean in word and sacrament. So the government then not explicitly promoting word and sacrament, but by default it is. And those are good things. You would want that. And I would argue even a moral framework in Christianity, which you cannot have any morality or good or justice or righteousness outside of God himself, that those things are derived from that, that they're in fact the good for all people. And the only people that would be upset about that, again, would be those who are ignorant to it or those who are openly practicing wicked, wickedness. We're I said, talking about destroying the foundation of Western civilization, basically. I said to a kid when uh, a few years ago we were in a store, and I said something to him about uh, Christianity, and I said, "Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody just applied the Ten Commandments in their daily life?" He right. said, "He said yes, all but the first one." Oh, sure, that's the wickedness. It's yeah, no, I get. It. I mean, you shall have no other gods. Yeah, yeah, right. But again, if if the church proclaims an eternal gospel, I mean, you would want these things. I, Absolutely. I, you know, I and I and I will be. We're going to walk through where it can fall into pitfalls. Right. And and uh, we, we can I mean, again, we're not confusing our our Christian faith with the state and and blending them together and worshiping the state, which happens for people, too. Absolutely does. Um, but there's still distinct things and we should keep them distinct. But I think sometimes we use the excuse of separation of church and state so we can say that these two things are compartmentalized. And I don't have to, I deal with this over here, but this over here, you know, is something totally different. Or what Lutherans do, and we'll talk about this, and we're going to run out of time. But we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here in a little bit. But um, what Lutherans do is they tend to have this understanding of two kingdoms. And we'll talk about those two kingdoms, the kingdom of the left and kingdom of the right. And like the kingdom of the right, I'm in the church and that's, you know, my heavenly kingdom. And, you know, and then the kingdom of the left, I live in the state, you know. But the, the thing is, Christ is Lord over both kingdoms. He's not just like, you know, uh, what the excuse will say, people say, well, my kingdom is not of this world. Right. It's not of this world in that it's wicked and evil. Let go of, yeah. Right. Let go of your thoughts. Right. And but, your wants. but he also says all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's he's Lord over everything. And so, you know, whether somebody admits it or not, I mean, he's still Lord over this nation and uh, all the nations of the world. So we should reflect that and how we live uh, together in that nation. Um, let's do this. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, the separation of church and states doesn't exist. So, I mean, Hebrews four says for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even the divisions of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a, a, a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So God's word does something to you and to this world. And at the very least, it informs you. So you think, do I really want to live under a government that's utterly detached from moral considerations from Christianity, right? I, I don't I don't know who would say, yeah, I would love that. And if they do, I, I would I would welcome to to have them explain that. But if you are a Christian, I don't think you would want that. And so if the government does things that are are diametrically opposed to our faith, then that's bad and they shouldn't do that and we should want our shared nation our shared people group here uh to be under the uh uh a a christian morality at the very least we talked about this when we went through jude but jude writes about this practice for christians and um you know, he, he writes us in, Belove, Beloved, while I, I was very diligently to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's your Christian faith. 
for certain men have crept in unnoticed. And this is what happened in the incident that he's particularly pointing at long ago who are marked for condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord, Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ, a denial of Christ is both in belief and practice. That's what's happening. It's the practice that, that Jude is particularly pointing at. They deny Christ in their practice, and they deny what they know to be true uh, in what they do. So, I mean, again, Christians should have their Christian faith inform um, how they act in this world, even in a political world which falls underneath their faith, doesn't supersede it or stand outside of it. And if a nation which is founded upon a Christian belief um, should act in that way as well, and if it doesn't, then it's going to reap the benefits or the, the repercussions, rather, of that, right? Right? Um, let's break before we get to the Augsburg Confession, and obviously I need to separate this up a little more, but uh, uh, we'll stop here, and then we'll continue on. We'll talk about a Lutheran framework in the Confessions and a relationship between church and state. We'll talk about even how the Missouri Synod has, uh, it doesn't separate itself from the state. In fact, there have been several court cases that the Missouri Senate has been uh, behind uh, in the promotion of the state doing what's right for Christians. Um, and even our own Senate comments on uh, issues of the time in convention um, to include things like uh, divorce and uh, uh, homosexuality and marriage and the death penalty and all those things. Um, even including our, our Senate has commented on a bunch of, a variety of topics that happen in a political sphere, sphere because all of those things fall under uh, the word of God and are subject to them, uh, whether they want to be or not. Questions? Nope. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have called us, your holy people, gathered together in Christ, in your church, and you have blessed us to be placed in the nation that you give us. Lord, help us always to act and to do your will and discern the things of your will and to desire that we would be placed in a good government that you give us that is framed around your will and law and that punishes the wicked and promotes our peace and quiet lives as Christians lived out here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. There's some cucumbers over there if anybody wants.